Um, I said that I didn't need an introduction because I'm going to out myself as somebody. Why don't I give this to one of you who doesn't have a microphone? Um, because I'm a bit of an oddball in here because I come from the nonprofit sector. I don't have a business background, um, but there are a couple of reasons why I'm here and I'm delighted to be here. By way of introduction, I work for an American think tank, a public policy institution. Um, I'm also the leader of a women's network called Women in International Security, and it's a, a professional network of women who work in the field of security and international relations. Um, the German Marshall Fund has a board, uh, WISE has an advisory committee, and so in both places, very much, um, I, with my colleagues, have been very much thinking about um, the composition of these bodies and, you know, the diversity of expertise and affiliation diversity in terms of gender, age, ethnicity, demographic, and most importantly, I also think sort of the commitment to attend, a commitment to the organization and the mission um, of, and you know, you can translate this to sort of the private sector. Within the think tank, I've also been involved in uh, setting up a database of female policy experts, which again is about the visibility of women, but it's also about bringing the expertise of women two ongoing policy debates here in Brussels. So those are at least two reasons why I'm here today, and I'm delighted to have, you know, be able to talk to you and, and sort of also listen to sort of Saskia. Um, I'm not going to introduce them and read their bios because you have them in your folder. Um, I really want to use this time to ask them some questions, and I actually have been a really bad moderator because I haven't been in touch by email ahead of time introducing myself and telling you what I'm going to ask. But rest assured, I'm going to ask you about your personal experience. Um, all of them are here because they've been involved with EWAP um, as mentees, as mentors, as uh, consultants, as advisors, and users or future users of this database. So this is really about your personal experience. And um, Saskia, if you don't mind um, starting with you again, and again asking um, you to sort of come talk about your personal experience of maybe just briefly showcase an example of uh, a board membership that you've experienced in your own company or where it has been only men and then where you had a diverse board and sort of the difference that has made. Um, every board is pretty male, so uh, I can take um, a lot of the examples, but I had the advantage of coming from the IT sector for years and I'm, 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 I'm born um, in, in not as a CEO, but doing <laughs> operational roles. So I've been living, I've got five brothers, I'm the only girl, and I'm working in IT, and so it wasn't really for me an issue. Um, and um, I know that women on board not completely agree on that statement, but I, I, I'm a believer of female competences. And I, some boards are lucky because there are some male with a lot of female competences also, so it's not all bad um, uh, about that. Um, the, biggest, um, the biggest challenge I see is, is, is the fact that they all are um, recruiting the same as they are. So I, I, I say as a joke, blue suits and brown shoes, but they, they really have the same age, they come from the same background, they have the same studies. Um, if it's a French company, then at least they have done uh, the, uh, the, the same military service or the same political party and and that is really bothering me and what is the most difficult if you then start asking questions like I said yeah, you must really be a woman to ask that kind of question and then you have to be then sometimes it can be alone huh? you start doubting about yourself was my question then wrong or so it, it asks a little bit more preparation um, to the meetings I think I'm more prepared than some of my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jerry, I wanted to ask you, uh, also by way of uh, sort of a side note, we were supposed to have two men on this panel because when I was called up to ask if I was going to be willing to moderate the session, I said yes, but only if I have a diverse panel. <laughs> Eva did, a, did try, there were supposed to be two, one unfortunately got sick, so, but I'm very glad, Jerry, that you're still here. I wanted to ask you, because you come from the private sector, um, you've been there for a long time, you've been in executive positions. Um, how do you see the sort of talent pool, this database to be 
be used? Who in the company is actually the one going and sort of looking at it and, and, and sort of selecting a few that uh, he, she will then bring back, back as suggestion? Well, um, the first point to make is that this is an extremely important initiative. And why do I say that? Because the corporate sector is in a pretty bad way. The banks have been fined a total of $160 billion. If we think of what happened to Volkswagen, marvellous German company, what happened there is likely to cost that company at least 30 to $40 billion. We can think about what happened to BP in the Gulf of Mexico. We can think of, tax, uh, of Tesco, a big retailer in the UK. We can think of Toshiba in Japan. We can think of the mining disaster, the BHP, in Brazil. In other words, the corporate sector is in a bad way. But not just the corporate sector. Think of sport and the corruption of FIFA, for example, or with the Olympics. Or we can think of education, or we can think of health, or we can think of charities. We have a very big problem about the standard of governance of all of these institutions. And I can speak with a great deal of experience, particularly of business, but also of the education sector because I'm a council member of a, of a, of a very good university. And what is needed in order to change that situation, one of the things that's needed is to improve the diversity of boards. That is what is needed. And how do you do that? How you do that is to prove, for example, that women, as an example of people who do make a board far more diverse, that that makes a difference to, the, to, the, to that organization and how it is run, and that improves it. And there is a lot of evidence which demonstrates that, and I'm now actively involved in some research with a business school where we've got uh, someone doing a PhD specifically on this issue of how does a board change when you have women as part of it. I know from my practical experience the benefit that women bring and I've been very much involved in making important appointments of women that have made a difference to the boards of companies where I've either been a chairman or I've been a director. But this is the fundamental issue and that's why this initiative is so important. Thank you. I'm going to come back and ask you another question later on, but I want to give Tara, both Tara and Andrea an opportunity because you have been mentees in this program. You've been on boards before. You aspire to future boards. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences having, serving on boards and sort of the difference you think you've made and um, how you see yourself sort of moving forward, being part of this um, platform? Thank you. Um, I have been on board, uh, among others, of an American company, and, and, and I am currently, and I am the only non-American in that context. Um, did I make a difference? I work with creative industries and I would like to sidestep to the digital transformation. The creative industries, the music and the film and set, etc., have already been going through a tremendous, tremendous digital transformation. Industries have been ruined. And it happened just like Saskia said, when the music industry, I wonder if somebody still remembers when Napster came about. And yeah, bad enough. The film industry the next year said, too bad for the music industry, but this will never ever happen to the film industry because the film files are so big, they will never ever go through the tubes. It only took two years before the compression compressed the films so that they travel. Complete uh, kind of transformation of the industries. And I'm working in the company who is going to serve those industries. My added value to the industry and to the organization that I serve is to not only be a European and the only European in the board is 
to bring the worldwide view because I work in my day-to-day -day activities, the consulting activities in developing countries. And that is a dimension that I would like also to reinforce. It is imperative that we kind of show the way in Europe, but the bigger world is over there. And if we only concentrate on Europe, I'm afraid we will sink. We will need to see the bigger perspective, how the developing countries today are uh, transforming themselves. If we don't take that into account, I'm afraid we will kind of be facing a future where the Chinese or the Indians just say to us, we are simply better, we are quicker, we are more modern. And that is the kind of perspective that I'm trying to preach all over. Yes, more diversity, 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 women among others, but I would like to emphasize also the role of younger people. If we don't get younger people to the board, we will be in a bad shape. So I would like to answer your question in two parts. Um, before I joined uh, starting Go With Boards, I uh, had a career in uh, one company, so I had the possibility to grow in the one company. And what I have realized was, as long as I was on a lower level, the feedback I was getting was that I make a big difference as a woman. The climber in the room is much better, people are more polite, more factual. So the feedback I got was really having a woman in the team is really a big plus. You bring uh, fresh ideas, new thinking, uh, so very, very positive. And this was the way how I have done my career. But at one point in time, I didn't got that feedback anymore. And that is for me a very, very interesting lessons learned. So I was growing up with this positive feedback and at one point in time it stopped. And exactly uh, like it was already said before, how can you ask that question? Why do you ask that question? Uh, I thought you have learned uh, so much. How can you ask that question when you come up with a creative uh, question? So it has changed during the different level of uh, management. And this is something which we have to um, bring the lower management people higher up in boards, but also in the management positions, so that they keep this positive thinking and this positive feedback they got. Okay. Thank you. Alison, I would like you to share with us a little bit, because I, as I understand, you've been advisor to Eva for a long time, and it sort of goes a little bit to what Tiara said also about sort of Europe, and this is a European database. Could you put this database and this work that this group has done sort of a little bit in a global context and sort of, you know, where do, where is Europe sort of standing when it comes to sort of women on board and, you know, how does talent database can sort of um, make, make a difference? Well, maybe I'll, I'll take a little biographical uh, loop to get there. I'm American uh, by birth and educated in the United States and then I spent 15 years in Sweden. And then I came to Belgium. Uh, at that point, I was a professor. I joined the faculty in 1985, and I was the first female teacher that the fourth year students in law had ever had. Uh, this was a big shock. In my department, I was also the only woman. Uh, again, 1985. Um, and uh, nobody gave me pri very much praise for being a, a fresh voice in the room. I was the only foreigner. I was the only female. And uh, it was a big shock. And I got very interested in women in decision making in Belgium. So I started to interview women leaders in 1985. And what is quite depressing is that when I would come and talk about my findings, the room would be only women. Mm. This is 1985. We're now in 2016. Um, I had the pleasure last week to talk to a company called VMware. They had a big fair. There was 10,000 people there. 90% of them were men. But there was an event, uh, an inclusion event. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, so it's going to be all the HR managers and the marketing people. They'll all be women. And I will be talking to the choir, so the people that already know this story. But the chief operating officer was there. And therefore, the room was half men. And it was very positive. I tend to be a funny public speaker, so there was lots of laughs. And it was laughs that were leading towards change. And so going back to what Saskia said and picking up what Jerry said about, well, it has to be different 
if I were to be a little disruptive, I have to say, yes, it's great that there's this talent pool. But what isn't great is what you'll get out of it will be people with the right education who've done the right steps and will come to the board and fit in. And this is important. We don't have enough women on boards. So it's a very important initiative. But if we want to think more out of the box, if we want to pick up what everybody says, we'll get more creative. We need to have more different kinds of differences in these boards. And it doesn't work if it's just one or two. That is a rule from sociology that goes way back. If you're the only woman in the room, you are the vessel for everything that they've ever hated about women. It's very, very difficult. So the company, the company, it won't work unless there's a strategic vision and it takes time. So right now in Flanders, we have two female rectors in universities. This has been a result of long-term public policy effort to get universities to change. So it goes back 15 years. And it takes a really long time to get there. And that's unfortunate, but it's good there's so many younger people in the room. And it's really good to think about ways to get these younger voices and different voices. The migration in Europe is tremendous. It's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. So to use that diversity of nationality, of ethnicity and experience through rules is, I think, where we have to go. But the first steps are volunteers like EWOB who make something that's really useful to business. Can I still ask you, especially also because you said you're American, so you came to Europe, put this effort into a global context if you can, sort of, how do you see it compared to what's happening in the US? Are there maybe some lessons <laughs> learned? <laughs> So I, I speak fluent Dutch, and so the TV station, I'm going to be on TV on election night. I think I'm going to be playing Hillary, because the guy that's going to be across from me is a famous Trump supporter who's Flemish. Um, and the, so what's going on in the United States is that you have women who are, my mother went to college. When I came to, to Belgium, all of my female friends were first generation university students. Their mother had not gone to university. So in the United States, you have a huge, huge category of educated women, frequently in relatively powerful places. And now we have an election that shows, back to my first point, men. This will be the biggest gender gap in the history of American elections. Men will be voting against women to some extent. There is that element of misogyny that has been so openly exposed, like a wound in the United States. The ability of Mr. Trump to say things that are said in locker rooms and still have 40% of the American public thinking about voting for him. So it is really about gender. And it shows that even a country like the United States that can have a candidate in an open election that's a female and highly qualified still has a lot of work to do with the basic fundamental idea that women's rights are human rights. And that this is carried by all of us. It makes a difference for men as well as for women. And that's so the American situation I can only go like that. But it shows that it's, it, it's not easy. This is something that goes so deeply into our culture. Yeah. It is, it's going to be a fight. And unfortunately, I always thought it would be over in another 10 or 15 years. Because in my interviews, everybody said in 1985, we just need a little time. And it was interesting that Salah said that, said that. We just need a little time. No, we don't need time. We need to work. <laughs> Do you want to respond, yeah, just, please? Because there is some, I hear what you say, and it's a, it's, a, it's a strange game. But if I listen to my kids, we have, we have five kids, three girls, two boys. And sometimes I have the impression that, um, sorry to say, but that the women problem is linked to a certain age. And, and I'll explain myself when I'm discussing that with my son of 15 or, or, or my daughter of 15 now. She says, mom, we go to the same school. We drink in the same pub, we, we, we read the same, we see the same films, that women thing. Um, are we not transforming it to a problem for them? Because I do not have the impression they both work, 
in my previous role, I had as many as m uh, more young men taking parental leave than, than, than young women. So shouldn't we at a certain stop repeating that it is a problem just not to influence in a negative way the, the younger generation? It was 1861 or so. Yes, but you probably saw the whole issue of women's lack of equality has been dealt with. And initially it probably felt that way, but as you rose up higher in the ranks, the problem was not exactly. So we, we, we would we expect that with the next generation or with the upcoming generation it's going to be solved. I don't think so. So I think... Uh, no, no, I, I, what I just said is that I think we, when, when you started your career and also when I started my career, we, we all thought, well, we are emancipated women and the issue of gender equality has been dealt with and we're going to strive ahead and achieve whatever we want to achieve and as we rose up rose up higher in the organizations we realized that many of those old ghosts were still vibrant and um, popping out of the closet so i think to expect that with the next generation coming in the issue is just going to solve because there seems to be more equality right now as they are at a certain age and in a certain situation i don't think that's going to be the case no, I, and so i think we need to we, continue to be mindful so to go to the discussion um i didn't say that it it's it, um, it's changed it's only as a business leader you need you need to make a correct anal analysis before you start finding a solution i've managing 12 nationalities so there is also a cultural impact on on gender which you can't take just one simple road in in even not in europe so all that I do appreciate. The only thing I want to be sure is exactly like I said for the, for the business models, we should maybe ask more the opinion of the young people before we start redoing the same things like we did for the last 100 years. That's the only point that I want to make. I'd like to point something out, and this is also why I called on you with the U.S. sort of difference. Um, my organization, we're going to, in a, in a month, we're going to do an event on, or it's actually a, a, a practical work, uh, workshop on women in politics, and it's bringing practitioners together who are talking, who, who have been working on getting women into elected office and sort of being to dare to run and to be po become po politicians and sort of in the conversations building up this one of the things we've experienced is so the us is really really good on individual personal development and professional development of individuals so you have some really really strong female leaders europe has been really good by putting forward some policies but we haven't really been so good in sort of really also pushing and developing the individuals. So this is one of the reasons why I find the talent pool amazing because, you know, it's part of really working and, and holding the individuals responsible, you know, work on yourself and sort of put yourself forward. Maybe the U.S. is, they need to do a bit more when it comes to the policy to create that environment to um, allow for women to thrive. And so we don't have that uh, same election in, in four years time. But Bringing this in a sort of wider context, I wanted to talk about um, a, you know, how do we get men on board in this initiative? Um, there is a bit of an imbalance uh, when it comes to the, you know, the audience and, and, and all of us women here in the room and only two men. So how do we get women, uh, men to sort of po support that initiative? And maybe, and I, again, I don't want to point anybody ask specifically, but ask you all to sort of jump in as you feel comfortable. Um, you know, what are some of the barriers that still exist that we need to reflect as we really want this talent pool um, to, to thrive? Sure, shall I start? You um, can. <laughs> well, just to give you one uh, interesting fact. Uh, if we take the uh, London stock market, uh, which is one of the most developed, I would say, uh, globally, if we look at how the appointments are made for the non-executive or independent directors on those boards, still 50% of those appointments are not made in any kind of formal way. In other words, a headhunter isn't used. There isn't a proper selection process using a nomination committee, even though the combined code, which is the code that regulates the stock market, says there should be that still is not happening. So we have a very real issue here about how appointments are made. And that issue has partly to do with the fact that there is an enormous amount of ignorance about what is this job of being 
an independent chairman or an independent director. What is it? And in order to deal with that ignorance, I wrote this book called The Independent Director. Why? Because I couldn't find a book that explained what this job is about. So what we're dealing with is an enormous amount of ignorance. Yes, there is prejudice. Of course there's prejudice. But there's also an enormous amount of ignorance about what is this job and what and making sure that every time there is an appointment to made to be made, it's done in a very proper way. And in those situations that women are given every opportunity equally. And that's another reason why this initiative is so important, because it makes that so much easier for headhunters and for companies to ensure that every time a board position is being filled, that it should be done in the proper way and that it should be every opportunity to search and find suitable women candidates. Thank you. Uh, I see the importance of the initiative and I have full trust on that the national organizations of EWOB uh, uh, will be very important in spreading the word. Sending simply the information to the major companies kind of excludes one excuse that there aren't any women that are kind of, they, they, they simply don't find any woman. That's the most common excuse you find. There aren't any, we would love to, we simply love to, but there aren't any competent women. That's, that's the reason we're here. And if I take an example from another continent, uh, the US, General Motors this year, for the first time, got a split of 50-50 in their board, taking the fact that they work in the automobile, automobile industry. I wonder how they found all the women. 50-50 in General Motors, I think it is pretty remarkable. So sending the message and sending the information from the national organizations to the companies in their respective countries, now at least you have a pool now at least you know what to search. I think it's a tremendous uh, plus. I would like to add something. I just, uh, there was just in the German uh, newspapers uh, an article in the Aufsichtsrat that, um, coming back to what uh, Gary said, that the, uh, the process of really uh, looking uh, for qualified uh, uh, for people uh, in the real process uh, is not working and that also uh, the headhunters uh, they have expected more business coming out of, uh, now you know in Germany we have a quota, and that they have expected that now with this quota there will be also more business and it's not. So that means uh, for me it's not only the question of finding the good women, where indeed yes we make a big step forward now with EVOP, but it's also the question of uh, the willingness uh, to consider, uh, so we are speaking about a cultural po uh, point on top, and here uh, a quota was helping, but it's also uh, only the first step, and I think even uh, even without uh, EVOP, uh, if you go in LinkedIn or in other uh, things, there were already before good possibilities to find qualified women. With EVOP now we push it more, I fully agree, and that's the right thing to do, uh, but we have to continue also working on the advertisement uh, for the companies and uh, discuss with them the cultural changes and the positive impacts of these cultural changes in the boards. Alison, would you like to add how do we get men on board how do what are kind yeah. of some of the barriers that we can work against uh, so, so there's a lot of organizations uh working on on this question and for a long time uh so the knowledge center will put you in touch not only with all the chapters of, of ewob but also other important organizations like catalyst and i would mention catalyst has a very very interesting thing it's called men acting for real change and it is a, a program uh, that recruits men that seriously believe that this is the way forward, that, you, that mixed groups work better. Mm -hmm. We know in social psychology, mixed groups work better. They really do. I mean, there's lots of, it's a, it's a scientific fact uh, that they work better. So um, uh, males that are convinced that this is better, that rooms that are single sex are not good rooms a lot of the time, and that they have to change it and to do it how. These men become active agents for other men to convince other men that you can be a man and be for this, that it's masculine 
and cool to be doing something about this, not just from your club chair, but actually you have to be active. You have to look outside of the club at different kinds of things and find out from other men, they probably also actually know qualified women. But you have to be able to talk about it in a serious way, as a man. And that's what this organization does, is it provides, first of all, showing men, women need this too, that in our life we work with a lot of stereotypes. It's sociologically necessary to work with stereotypes. We can't survive without stereotypes. We all have them, but we have to get rid of them when we're doing business. We have to, first of all, know we have them. We can't help it. We grow up in cultures. And then second of all, free yourself of that. And that's what their training does for men. Men who say, in my world, it's all about quality. It's not about gender. I don't know how many male professors have said, we picked this person on the basis of their CV. And then you discover, well, how do you evaluate a CV? What's important that you did in your life? Who decides what's important on that? And it turns out there's a lot of bias in that. And training how to do that is really, really important. The Scientific Foundation of Flanders has suggested that they will now, to get a fellowship, it's very prestigious, only one out of, in my council, only one out of 50 people gets one of these fellowships. The idea is to do in-person interviews. Who would be the interviewers? 12 professors who have no experience in human resources, <laughs> right? But not train about bias, nothing. They will decide a person who is 22 years old, who has never taught, who has never done a public presentation, will come with their scientific project and have 10 minutes in front of 15 professors to defend themselves. I put up my little finger and said, there might be some problems with this. But that's was supposed to be neutral and value-free. But if you know about unintentional bias, you know that that's not going to work if you don't train those people. So men aware can be enormous, like the little fabulous bombshells, splinter bombs in society to get other men on board. And I think that's really, I've thought this for, since, for really a long time actually, like since the 70s, but uh, I think that's really what has to happen next. So these resources, let men know there's lots of, you, it's not hard. It's not rocket science anymore. You can look at our website, you'll find 700 things you can do in your com company. Companies have been doing this. There's good companies out there, and they're doing really interesting things. So it's not like we don't know how to do it, but we need to want to do it. And it needs to not just be the women. Okay. May, may I just make a suggestion Please? for... Um, 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 so just for, for letting, getting the men on board, because we're not going to solve the problem of unconscious bias. I still have it in my organization. Um, so it will still keep us awake for, for months. But maybe finding some ro male role models and asking them to promote European women on boards, I think it will be more powerful than we all together. <laughs> and I still remember the, and thank you for that, I think it was together with, with, with PwC, we did a mentorship in the beginning of Women on Board in Belgium. I had a male mentee and it helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. Because he explained how it happens in that room, around that table, and, and how the network is thinking. So I think we should have some male role, role models instead of us. Like a male ambassadors for Eva. Or champions. Um, I have lots of questions for you, but I also know that the audience, there are some people in the audience who have questions, and one of you already proactively jumped in, so assertiveness, I like that. Um, I have one here. So one or two. In here. Okay, Thank there's you. one there, and there's one there. Uh, listening to you, and uh, there's one thing, uh, uh, I'm an engineer, studied with men, uh, worked with men, um, uh, enjoyed it quite a lot. Uh, the, the discussion about diversity in context of a board with the main purpose is to look for the best for the company. The diversity, in my mind, should be the best, absolutely best qualities, talents in the board. And in here, uh, uh, 
I think talent pool is a wonderful tool to give access for the knowledge and the capabilities that, that exist in here. Uh, for me, it's not so much uh, whether it's a man or a, or a female. I mean, of course, uh, this is important, but I, I would like to emphasize the thing that if we can talk in a language for them, which they understand and tell about this talent pool giving access to the best capabilities, I think that would be a good marketing tool. Thank you. So it's more a comment than a question? It was more of a comment since I, I had the questions, but they, they went around already. Okay, I th we have somebody here. Thank you, Karina. I would have a zillion questions to put you because this has been really inspiring. Um, but I will reduce myself to two. One, uh, the business case for gender diversity is made. At least we agree on that in this room. Not everywhere, but here we agree. Change, the future is here today. We have so many challenges to tackle that we cannot manage to waste talent and women talent is needed because of all the female competences you've mentioned, innovation, adaptability, connection, etc., etc., etc. Still, the UN says that the current rhythm of development in taking women to the top, to the decision-making positions, we will still ta have more than 100 years to go. So we will be, if we're still around, which I doubt, <laughs> things uh, are going to take a little bit more than what we would like. So I would like to have to to have your thoughts on this. The second issue relates to what Alison was mentioning about, it's not about only about having more women, it's about women that are actually bringing forward these competences that are female, right? Because we have seen so many women having to adapt to systems where they were a minority, so they just had to give up what were their um, female uh, talents and to put on a, 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 ha a hat of male maleness. Um, how can we uh, use, or how can you use in this uh, excellent um, initiative of the poll, um, having these 150 women that you have already in the poll, uh, being themselves ambassadors, not only of being women on boards, but being women that promote women's competences and talents, not only on boards, but to the other women that want to go up to. Thank you. So I think this is a question for the two of you who are part of the talent pool. But go ahead. I think the mentoring program that uh, WOP just had is one way of, of, of enhancing the courage of women, the mentees, to take on board more than they currently have. And uh, during the forenoon, we kind of concluded that there is still a, quite a number of fear in the minds of women taking uh, bolder uh, steps in their career. And if through a mentoring program or equivalent programs, we can diminish the kind of mental fear of taking on board uh, more bold initiatives and striving to get higher up in the hierarchy and to the boards is one way of doing as I see it. We talked quite a lot about it during the, during the closure of the mentoring program that still for some reason there seems to be very talented younger women but somewhere inside there is a fear which you almost don't dare to say aloud but only in a very confidential mentor-mentee relation, you would reveal that, yeah, I'm still scared. And as soon as you, you kind of spell out your fear, half is already won. Hmm. And I would like to add, because of your point of the 100 years, we discussed that also, I think, last time here in uh, March. And here it's, it's about us to bring the snowball uh, effect running. So those of us who are there, who can uh, then bring in names from, from other women, and uh, by nominating other women, also telling them exactly like in a mentoring program, hey, you are able to do that. Yeah. So we, those of us who are in boards, we can play this, um, this, this yeah, not only role model, but also the snowball effect and bringing the others in to give them also more confidence. 
I think just for, for, for women on board locally, um, the, m the most difficult one is the first. If you have a first mandate and you fall into the male system of being binary, you have a reference, so tick in the box, you have a reference. So I think we, we should help each other um, in having the first mandate. Executive search will not do that because they work also in the old way. Um, but between each other, that, that can help. And I, can, I could imagine that it's the same on the European level. So um, help each other on getting the first in what category you want to play. I think that's an important one. But uh, I'm, am I allowed to answer? <laughs> I, think, I think they made the right choice. You must focus. If you start an initiative, you have to focus. If you don't focus, you will not win anything. And I think it's m we did the same thing with women on board in Belgium. We first made a good pool, and then you can take up another challenge. Um, there is, I'm a personally a very big believer of having young advisors. But then first we need to decide, for example, they should not have the same legal obligations. I'm personally liable for decisions taken and not taken during my mandate. We should not give those responsibilities to your people. So it should be a kind of a young advisors team, which the board is listening to with a clear mission, but not necessarily the same legal um, uh, context. And that's not ready yet. Yeah, maybe I also can um, a little bit answer to that question from you. Um, I'm Tanya, I'm from Germany. And um, actually, should I? No. I should have stood up, okay. Um, yeah, what I would like to, uh, to add to the discussion is the first thing. Indeed, um, women need a lot more acceptance. Yeah? So I also have a master degree, I have two post-master degrees, so it's, it's a typical case that women always need to prove, even if they already have proved that they are excellent, no, they need to prove they are super excellent. I have been asked, I was a CFO leading a company of 2 million euros in revenues, I have been asked in the second position if I could repeat this. Yeah? What should I actually say to such a question. Should I, could I repeat it and say, sure. Yeah, I even could lead a company of 10 billion euros or 20 billion euros. So what do they want from me? Yeah, so this is the typical trap actually a woman is in. And currently we are in Germany in a special trap because we have this quota of 30%. The question actually what everybody, every woman needs to ask and every, nearly every woman has also a man um, at her side, yeah. Also, they have to promote us and, and really um, be, a, be a good ambassador of us because they know that we are excellent. Yeah, my partner knows that I'm excellent, so I ask him to promote myself as well. So, but coming back to the point, yes, you need at least to have one, um, let's say, acceptance test positively absolved, which is the first mandate. And then it really gets easier. And I'm really grateful because my first company was General Motors and I had the chance to, to uh, uh, yeah, develop myself equal as, 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 as male. And one thing I would like to mention here, two weeks ago there was um, a headline in one German newspaper, the Handelsblatt. And um, we all talk about positive migration coming to Germany, but there is also some negative migration out of Germany. And it's 140,000 people a year. 60% of these 140,000 people, 80,000 people, are women. And the majority of these women is 25 to 35 years old, excellently educated. And only four of 10 say, we might think about going back to Germany. Yeah? 80,000 women, excellently educated every year, go out of Germany, and nobody cares. So therefore, I'm so glad that we have EWOP, that we have now a platform where every European excellent woman can really find a way to get on this platform and have a chance to get detected by headhunters or companies. And I would really be glad if thousands would approach you and say, hey, we need you to our next board position. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks. Any final comments from our panelists? I'd just like to say uh, a few remarks about why we haven't got any time. I mean, to think about it being 100 years, this would be an absolute, absolute, absolute disaster. Um, 
because this is an extremely urgent matter to have more diverse boards. Why? Four reasons. One, I talked about all the scandals we've had with companies and the banks, of course, being the worst example. If you calculate the loss in shareholder value, that's billions and billions of dollars as a result of these companies being badly directed and badly governed because of their ineffective boards. Second reason is all of the redundancies and human tragedy that resulted from that. Third reason are all the pension deficits, which also are linked to that. The pension deficit, for example, in the US, of all the public pension funds is four and a half trillion dollars. And the last point is the cost in terms of the government and bailouts for, fail, for companies that fail. The worst example in the UK was the Royal Bank of Scotland, where 50 billion pounds had to be found, and that bank has continued to lose money for the last seven years. These are the real reasons why we need more diverse boards and this is the real reason why this is such an important uh, initiative. Thank you. I think uh, one issue is reframing the notion of competence, what competencies are needed in the future. And if we do manage to reframe the notion of competence, then it's only to diversify, diversify and diversify both age, ethnic background and gender. There was a question? No, go ahead. No, well, actually, it's, it's not a question, but it's an additional comment uh, uh, with, uh, regardless of the question that's been said. I think if we need indeed to work on competence, we also need to work on what is performance. I mean, what is really the performance we're looking at in, in, in the economy? Because we, we, what is said in all the, we, we have, um, so some studies have been listed uh, um, and mentioned uh, since the beginning of uh, the afternoon, uh, saying that it brings value added to have diversity on boards. But we know that the numbers say diverse things. Huh? So I think it's important that globally there's a reflection about what type of performance we're looking at. And we know that diversity is usually bringing value added in, in, in the sustainable uh, performance. So if we have more emphasis in terms of what it brings to the society to avoid indeed the cost that we have seen in the past for some industries, and if we push this type of ideas, I think it will, it will also support the idea that diversity brings value added in the minds of men managing companies today. I think it helps convincing them that they need diversity to have a more sustainable growth. I don't want to repeat myself, but for me, the key message uh, of all of you today is really that partly uh, we can really help each other and that one of the key success factors is really that uh, we drive the snowball effect in helping uh, each other. And here, are, thank you very much also for this event today. I think uh, having an event like that is an excellent uh, possibility to network between us. Uh, the platform is, is really helping a lot to have a better base, let's say. We are not hanging in the air. We have a good base, uh, but it's really one of the key success factors that we are supporting each other and uh, yeah taking care of each other okay I, I don't know how this works maybe I'll just take over over to this Andreas uh, yes yeah, so it's, it's there have been so many really 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 interesting ideas and I will just throw on two or three small extra ones first of all what Jerry said um, Actually, women make up 60% of university students in many countries in Europe right now, and they're not making up 60% of top management. So it's not only a waste for companies in terms of their performance, but it's also a waste socially that these talents are not getting used adequately. So I think that that's a very important thing. The second thing is helping others. Uh, that's an old feminist mission. Uh, one of the things that surprised me about the Hillary, Bernie Sanders, conflict was younger women um, not being interested in Hillary Clinton and being very angry that older women said you have to help each other because they said we have other things that we want to do and what I very much admire is what's going on digitally so hashtag 
attacks about everyday sexism, both in Belgium and in the United States, that's younger women helping each other, but maybe they're not thinking about helping each other. They're just very angry and want change in their own way, for their own world. And I think we have to, we can say it would be good if people helped each other. I think it would be good that men would help us and that we would help men and everybody would help each other. That's like a moral value. But you shouldn't say, because you're a woman, you have to help other women. You shouldn't tell people that. If they believe it, fine. But we, as older women, shouldn't say to younger women, it's your job. They have to discover it themselves, and they will discover it themselves, as long as 90% of the decision makers in our society are men, women will discover this. And I think it makes a difference that it's 90% men, as was pointed out by Jerry, and all sorts of things. Second point, sustainability was mentioned many, many times. This is a real challenge. I don't know whether women can help meet this challenge, but I do know we need all of us. And so if excellent minds are not coming to the table where decisions are made to face the sustainability crisis of our planet, we are cutting all of ourselves short. So it's not just about profit, but the profit aspect, figuring in costs. I know good female accountants who talk about the cost of a product. Moving a product from China to here is not free. No matter how cheap it was to make it, it's not free. So globalization has limits, and they're the limit of our planet. And we need the best minds, whoever they are, to come to the table and not be held back by stupid stereotypes and old culture. We need to change it. So those are last thoughts about why we need this pool of talented women to use them better. Thank you. I don't know if Saskia, do you have any? <laughs> I just want to con congratulate because um, this is another initiative um, done in order to don't complain but just do, do something about it. So um, congratulations for the energy and the passion that um, you have put in, in finding those and listing those 150, one, two, three women. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's, it starts with doing something and, and, and then uh, firstly, secondly, to avoid that you will have to do some fundraising. If we, if we all, I don't know how many people are here, but um, take at least a commitment to communicate through social media. It doesn't cost anything, by the way. Eh? But if everybody communicates at least once a month around this through social media, then we don't have to look to them what you should do is communicate. I think we should stop saying what the others, let's do it ourselves and take a commitment ourselves in order to make this a success. Okay, and I'm actually going to continue on this line um, in terms of commitments. Um, maybe I get some of you to go home tonight and either talk to your fathers or your partners and your husbands and ask them to do what they do for you, support you, to do that also to the female employees that they have as sort of continuing the snowball effect. Um, I will try and do my share. I'm joined in this room here with a friend of mine with whom I'm actually co-authoring a book on women leaders in Brussels. And one of the things we are doing is doing a mapping exercise of organizations that support women in Brussels. And I think I, it's fair to say that Eva will be part of it because also of its mentoring program. So we'll help with this um, sort of advertising, and I also have uh, access to many different women's networks, professional and policy, and also younger ones, and I think that's also a point that has been well taken. Let's bring them in and sort of um, share, get their opinions um, on it. And I just want to leave you with one uh, sort of image, um, because yes, we need pragmatism to get this going, but I, I still continue to dream that this will happen very, this happens quicker than this morning. This morning I was woken up, well, I had to wake up my daughter to take her to school, and she said, hey, I'm not done dreaming yet. Let me stay a little bit longer in bed, and let's continue dreaming, but also let's get to work. So thank you so much for your contribution, for inviting me, and good luck, and I will do everything possible to help Evo take this further.